It was uh, March 27th, 2020, in the middle of COVID, very soon after lockdown. And I found myself on this day being crushed by people around me. I had people in front of me, people in the back, uh, the warm, wet, sweat, hands that were coming around me, through my neck, around my back, hitting my cheek. And I remember seeing people in front of me, people behind me. I was right in the center. I was the center of attraction. And there were thousands of rupees notes flying around. And I couldn't remember who I gave the thousand rupee note to and who I didn't give the thousand rupee note to. And I looked at my feet to make sure that my feet were still off the ground because I feared for my safety. I was being crushed. And it wasn't just me being crushed. My wife was next to me. She was being crushed. And I was more afraid for her safety than I was for my safety. And I remember struggling through the crowd like an ocean, using my hands to split apart the crowd, finding my way to the car, people pushing me, grabbing me, managing to open the door, making sure my wife got into the car, and struggling to shut the door because there were people and their hands were inside. And I was afraid for my life, and I said, is this, is this the last day of my life? I managed to shut the door, and I managed to start the car, and people were climbing on top, and I managed to get out onto the main road. And I drove, and motorcycles were following me. And I kept driving, and they kept following me, and I remember driving up and down the canal as far as I could go, hoping that they would stop following me because they would run out of fuel in the motorcycle. And that's exactly what happened. So let me take you back. How did, I, how did I end up there? What happened? What had happened was, during lockdown, during COVID, I had found that my business had come to a halt. No one was hiring. Rosie.pk is the largest jobs platform in the country. But during COVID, people were laying off. People were losing jobs. They weren't hiring. My clients weren't paying me because they didn't have any money. We were under lockdown, our team was at home. There was nothing to do. And when that happens and you're at home, you start to think. Incidentally, during lockdown, everyone was struggling to get masks. It was a big deal back then, trying to get hold of a mask. And I had a friend in Gulberg next to Main Market who had masks and said, come to my house, I have masks, I'll give you masks. And even though there was lockdown, I snuck out went as quickly as I could to get masks because I wanted to keep my family safe from this new disease. So we needed masks. And on my way there, in Main Market, on the roundabout, there's nobody there, it's locked down. I see about 15 or 20 workers on the footpath. They're sitting down in Bethlehem. And they have their tools. And I drove past them. And then all of a sudden it struck me, there's nobody here. What are these people doing on the street? So I turned around and I asked them, what are you doing? And they said, we've been here for two days. We don't have any work. We don't have food to eat because the work we do, we earn our income and that same night we spend it. We buy milk, we buy food for the next day and it starts again. There is no cash. There are no savings. And they were sitting, hoping somebody would come and give them work because they needed to feed themselves. And I didn't go get the masks. It was inconsequential at that point. I went straight home and I felt this dire need to do something because my family was complaining because we didn't get our imported cheese perhaps, right? And I said, these people are struggling for their lives. They haven't eaten in two days. There's no, pl what's going to happen? And there are many more people like them. And very emotionally, I told my wife, we have to go. We have to do something. She said, where are we going? I said, just come. You have to come. And in the safe of my house, I don't keep much cash, but I had a little bit of cash. And whatever cash I had, I put in a bag, and I took my wife, and we drove to Main Market because I wanted to find those unemployed daily wage workers and give them some money so they could put food in their stomachs. So we went, I found the daily wage workers, I parked my car, I stood, and I asked them to make a line. And as they came, I took money out 
and I would give a note to every one of them. One, two, three. All of a sudden, there weren't 15. There were 20, 40, 50, 100, 200, 300 or more people before I could even blink had a mass from I don't know where. And we were stuck with a bag of cash and people grabbing, and the same people grabbing money two or three times. And despite whatever I could do, I realized that this was dangerous. This could not scale. Our lives were at risk. So we went home. I dragged my wife out. She wanted to stay. I said, it's unsafe. We have to go. We'll find a better way. There has to be a better way to help. We went back home, and we began to think what we can do. And up until COVID, the internet was growing. More and more people were getting smartphones. More and more things started happening. But during COVID, all of us became much more attached to our mobile phones. Usage increased. Payments increased. And you know what? People who never had mobile phones before bought mobile phones for the first time, smartphones. The cooks, drivers, plumber. This is a chokidar, this is a rickshaw driver, and all of a sudden, because everybody needed it, you couldn't get out. And as these phones began to spring up, these people started to learn what to do on their phone. And around that time, along with my co-founders, we had launched Pakistan's first mobile wallet called SimSim. This was the first wallet bank account you could ever open on your phone before Jazz Cash and EasyPasa moved to the smartphone. So we understood the regulations and the processes to create online bank accounts. We understood how you could transfer money from one phone to the other or transfer money from the phone to somebody's ID card that they could go to a Jazz Cash EasyPasa agent and withdraw it. We had built these things before. With Rosie, we had learned to build these online platforms that are now used by 9.8 million professionals and 65,000 employers and made millions of people find jobs. So we'd seen what the internet could do in its early stages, and more and more people were getting smartphones, so we decided, why not do something better that can scale? So during lockdown, and we have a brilliant team, amazing team members, we recruited people from the worker Abadis, and we said, look, you're unemployed, but you have smartphones. We created an app called the Rosie Dost app, and we said, take this app, and everybody around you who's unemployed, which is everybody and needs money, fill out a questionnaire. And it was an online survey. We took their ID cards. We made sure they were real. We asked their household income, how many kids they have, where they live. And very quickly through this form, which these volunteers in Urdu were filling out by going house to house in those abadis, we managed to digitally score how needy who was and their phone numbers and their ID cards. And we got this massive database and then we built a crowdfunding site that we called Project Pakistan. And we told our friends in the US and UK, in, in here in Pakistan, all over, donate through the site. And you could go to Project Pakistan and give 1,000 rupees, 2,000 rupees, do a bank transfer, do a credit card transaction. And soon people started to donate money. And what we were doing is, as our field workers were going house to house and uploading profiles and assessing their need with their consent, their profile and video would be uploaded to the site. And our algorithm would dynamically choose the most needy. And the algorithm would then throw money directly to the ID cards of the workers. They would get an SMS, and they would go to the closest Easy Pesa agent, show the ID number, and take their money. This was not possible five years ago. This could not have happened five years ago. And they say necessity is the need of invention. Uh, it's because when you're stuck, trapped in a corner, and you have to do something, and the sheer need of doing that, it compels you to understand what resources you have around you today, which are not the same resources you had around you yesterday. And it teaches you how to use them and come up with new ideas and new solutions. And we've seen so much innovation happen during the last few years in this country. So we, as a nation, have this new tool in our hands. 
And it's the most powerful tool that we've ever had in our history. It is your smartphone that's connected to the internet. And why am I saying it's the most powerful tool? I'm not saying this because you can go on your phone and listen to music or order a hamburger. Great things to have. I am saying this because now in Pakistan, 110 million people have smartphones. And it's connected to the internet. And you know what? Half of them, about 50 million people, have come onto the internet in the last five years. They were never on the internet before. And their first experience coming onto the internet is not a desktop, it's not a laptop, it's that used smartphone that they just bought. And they're not very educated. They can't read and write. They don't have money. These are the same people I met on the streets in Main Market. And now 50 million of them have smartphones, and they've learned to use these phones. They've learned how to send voice notes. They've learned Facebook. And this is a tremendous asset because we have democratized opportunity. If you had the bad fortune of being born in an impoverished household, you do not have access to the same opportunities that we do. Now, with the advent of these technologies, subject to our imaginations and our courage, we are able to build applications and platforms to bring prosperity from the top of the pyramid all the way down. And we have an obligation to do that. And it makes economic sense to do that. But it's our responsibility to use this technology and solve the problems for everyone around us, especially the common man at the bottom of the economic pyramid that does not get opportunities to learn, to earn, and to live a life of happiness. This is a tool we have at our disposal, and there's so many things that are happening in this country right now that's leveraging this technology, and I hope all of you will also be a contributor to this movement. There's gold at the bottom of the digital pyramid. As they get prosperity, the money trickles up. They buy more. As they buy more, the businesses of your friends do better, and the money goes all the way up. So it makes economic sense. It's in everybody's interest. It's not just for doing good. It's in your personal economic interest to do this. With Project Pakistan, this initiative, five people in lockdown from their homes, essentially, built a platform which onboarded over 10,000 households, 50,000 people in two months. We dispersed money, a team of five, powered with the internet and smartphones and volunteers to give money to 50,000 people who needed it most during COVID. And this platform has now turned into an employment pl platform that we call rosegar.pk. Those same people are being put into jobs, they're uploading videos, they're finding jobs. And now we have learned that we can actually give jobs to people at the bottom of the pyramid who we thought we could never connect with in a digital manner. And they have absorbed this medium. So 60,000 people on the back of a smartphone and a very small team of passionate people. And you know what? We've just begun. We have just begun. These are ideas I believe are worth sharing. Thank you very much.